Well, um, it is um, so good to, to see you guys uh, and to be virtually with everyone for this year's Patient Summit. Um, I'm so glad to be joined by Maleva and other members of our CDCN team. Um, and I see Gary's messages coming in about the impending Bambino number two. Thank you, Gary, I appreciate that. Um, you know, we look forward to this day so, so much. This is our, this is what we call our Super Bowl. You know, all year long, we look forward to our patient summit. And of course, we especially love it when we can actually all be in person here in Philadelphia. Um, and I so hope that, um, that we'll, we'll be able to do that next year. Um, it's also so great for me to, to see names uh, of people that I've emailed with and spoken with um, over the years and to actually um, be able to see that you guys are on today with, with all of us. We have um, a really incredible team that's dedicated uh, to Castleman disease and to really advancing uh, research and treatment for all of us um, that battle Castleman disease. So I'm going to kick us off today with a few slides for, um, for welcome. I hope that um, everything went really well in um, Maleva's Getting to Know You session, um, but I'm going to start out by sharing my screen. Great, hopefully you guys, um, let's see, it still says loading. Yeah, hopefully you guys can see my slides. So, um, you know, every year we like to start out by, um, by thanking um, our sponsors who uh, have made um, this day possible. And uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, which hopefully um, you all know well, and use of pharmaceuticals um, who have been really wonderful um, partners and supporters um, of the Castleman's effort. Um, I, I wanted to begin by first highlighting um, members of our team. You would have met many of them throughout the session uh, over the last hour, um, but some of them are new and some of them have been with us for a while. Um, we don't have time to, to go around and everyone uh, introduce themselves, but, um, but photographed here, um, we have Mary Zaccato, who's been with us for many years, um, helping to lead the organization, Maleva, who you all know um, so well. And if you don't know Maleva, um, you should reach out to her and get to know her. She's um, such an incredible part of our community. Um, then we've got Sheila Pearson, who's been leading our Accelerate Registry in clinical research for the last five years. Uh, Amber Cohen, our executive administrator, who helps to make sure the logistics happen and get done on time and as they should. At Mike Gonzalez, our newest member of our scientific team. He's a, a stellar immunologist and a computational biologist, so he'll be helping us to move the science forward. Anya Korsinska is photographed on the far right of the top row. She is a PhD student studying drug repurposing, taking a drug approved for one thing and using it in new ways, um, helping us out in, in a lot of ways. Down to the bottom left, uh, any of you who have been involved in our uh, clinical trial of serolimus will know Tracy Sakura. Tracy also leads all of our COVID-19 work. Um, then we have Bridget. Bridget is our new biobank coordinator who I know you all met during the last session. Um, she has uh, had big shoes to fill in following Johnson uh, as an incredible biobank coordinator, but really done a great job thus far. Um, then we have Melanie photographed next to Bridget. Melanie is also um, our newest scientist. She's an immunologist who's helping us to, to run experiments and tease apart Castleman disease, um, what happens in Castleman's. Um, next up is Mateo. Mateo is our newest uh, data coordinator who goes through you guys' medical records. Anyone who's part of Accelerate will have a full-time data analyst spend anywhere from one to three weeks going through your medical records, extracting out all the data, and then we review it together. Mateo's part of that newest team that's doing that. We have Stacy Guzman. Stacy's a PhD student who is performing studies on lymph node tissue from Castleman's patients. Um, then we have Russell, um, who like Mateo is a data analyst. Um, and, and we finally have Chris Well, who's our um, last member of the team that we're, we're showing here, but actually there are many more people who are part of this effort, but this is the team focused on everything Castleman's related. So just wanna um, orient you to them. They're gonna be um, with us throughout the um, throughout uh, today and tomorrow. And um, for them and for, for me and for all of us, we so look forward uh, to this opportunity to be with all of you. Um, so I always like to start out with some pictures from past patient summits. So this is our very first one. This is when I first met Maleva um, back in 2014. You can see we had a, a relatively small crew here. Um, and this is us in 2015. Um, Bigger crew, we got a little rowdier doing our Castleman Warrior Flex. Um, our 2016 was the first one we held in Philadelphia and you can see our numbers really rose. Um, 2017, another one here at Penn. 
um, 2018, another one here, and uh, 2019 also here at Penn. Of course, um, getting bigger every year, um, better and better at our Castleman Warrior Flexes. Um, and then of course, last year was virtual um, and this year is as well. So I wanted to, 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 to then transition briefly into my personal journey, um, chasing my cure, um, and then transition into what is Castleman disease. Um, so fortunately, I've got a chance to meet many of you, um, um, but those of you that I have not had the chance to meet, um, I was a medical student. I wanted to become a, a cancer doctor in memory of my mom who had died from cancer a few years before, when out of nowhere, I became critically ill with Castleman disease. I um, was diagnosed with idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease after spending months hospitalized in the intensive care unit, eventually got the diagnosis. Um, but this is back in 2010. There was no diagnostic criteria back then. There were no FDA approved drugs. Um, there was very little research that was underway or being done. Um, and, and frankly, there was very little hope and reason to be hopeful. Um, but I had and have still an incredible um, supportive system between my family and my friends. Um, and we decided that we were gonna take on Castleman disease um, and that we were gonna join together um, to search for solutions. Um, the picture of me with my dad um, photographed on the screen. Um, you can see me um, when I was really, really sick. Um, this is right around the time that I started getting chemotherapy. And um, for those of you that have had to get chemotherapy as part of your Castleman's treatment, you'll know that um, none of us want to get it, but, um, but sometimes it's exactly what you need to save your life. And so um, thankfully, um, chemo did save my life. And you can see um, that I, I've got my bald head um, and my big belly from all the organ dysfunction, um, but just so thankful to be alive. Um, I was, as I mentioned, eventually, di you know, eventually diagnosed with Castleman's, eventually treated with a lot of chemotherapy. Um, and I was started on an experimental drug that I hope would keep me in remission. When unfortunately, um, I relapsed. Um, and, and nearly died now for the fourth time, which was when I decided I wanted to take on Castleman disease. The picture on the far left side of the screen is of, of my now wife, Caitlin at the time, girlfriend. And it's one of my favorite pictures because on one shoulder, on my left shoulder, um, you can see a pump that's pumping this experimental drug into my port. Um, and this is this experimental drug that was giving me hope that it could, you know, that I would, you know, have a, a future. And then on my other shoulder, I have Caitlin, um, who's providing me physical support, um, you know, from, from someone that I love uh, and a loved one of mine. And I think that this is just a really good representation of, of, of my life over these last 11 years. I've got medical science technology, you know, on one shoulder propping me up and I've got my loved ones on my other shoulder also propping me up. So when I relapsed on that drug and I learned that there were no more drugs in development, um, back in 2012, I decided I was going to start the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. Um, it's, it's hard to believe for those of you that are more newly diagnosed, but, but there was just nothing. Um, uh, and so um, there was no research going on. There was no network of physicians. There was no diagnostic criteria or treatment guidelines. Um, and it was really, really overwhelming. Um, but we knew that we had to do it. And we began by assembling a really amazing team. So just to give you kind of a perspective where, where, where things were back in 2012, kind of pre-CDCN. So Benjamin Castleman first described Castleman's in 1954. Um, Castleman's was clearly determined to include a, or defined to have a unicentric and a multicentric subtype in the 70s. Kazuo Yoshizaki discovered that interleukin-6 was important for Castleman's in 1989. Um, and then fast forward all the way to 2005, which is when tocilizumab was first approved for the treatment of multicentric Castleman disease in Japan. Um, and then fast forward to, to 2012, um, when the CDCN was founded, and we merged with an organization called CARE, Castleman's Awareness and Research Effort, which is an amazing organization um, that we now are fully um, intertwined with. So where were things back in 2012? Well, um, there was only about $10,000 a year going towards research. The federal government here in the United States um, was not funding any research. There were no patients in a registry because there was no registry. Um, in addition to that, there were... Uh, two advocacy organizations, CARE and a group called ICDO, which were doing really important work for raising awareness um, and also connecting patients to doctors, but there was no scientific and research effort underway, um, no collaboration, no tissue or blood samples to work with in a biobank. Um, the disease was very poorly understood. There was no diagnostic criteria, so, so doctors didn't know um, what to test for to determine whether you had it or not. No guidelines for how do you treat this thing. No blood tests to predict whether one drug would be better than another drug. No FDA-approved treatments, and there was one drug in development, siltuximab, so um, but that drug had not worked for me, though it was thankfully working for a lot of other patients. 
So when we decided to start the CDCN, I partnered with um, Dr. Fritz Van Rie, who at the time was my physician, he's still my physician, but he's subsequently become my friend and my colleague. And we decided that the CDCN would be dedicated to accelerating research and treatment for Castleman disease and also revolutionizing biomedical research along the way. Our vision is a future where all patients diagnosed with Castleman disease are able to live full lives. That's full lives in quality and quantity. It, you know, our goal is that everyone will live with their disease in a way that they did before they ever were diagnosed with Castleman disease. Um, we do that through groundbreaking immunology research, um, through crowdsourcing and working with the whole community of physicians, researchers, and patients um, by really innovating around this idea of drug repurposing and also raising awareness and funds uh, for research. Um, the way we've done it is through connecting this incredible network of physicians and researchers all around the world. Um, these are just some of them at our annual meeting doing the Kassman Warrior Flex. Um, uh, and also connecting our patient community. This is a very outdated slide um, from, I think, four years ago where there was a pin for each patient that's part of the CDCN. Now, now it's over 1,200 patients that are part of the CDCN, and we, we, we certainly need to update our map. Um, but, but these are some of them, some of you all um, who were at one of our last um, meetings. It was held in person. So I'm now going to kind of superimpose what we've accomplished with this approach and the work that we've done over the last 12 years, or sorry, over the last nine years. Um, but you're also going to have many more opportunities um, throughout today and tomorrow to learn more about what we actually do. You know, what are the things, what are the programs we offer through the CDC and how can we support you? How can we support someone that you love? Um, but, but in terms of where we are today in 2012, um, you know, we went from about $10,000 a year for Castleman's research um, to now where we've raised $1.8 million for Castleman's research, and we've spent that $1.8 million on the most important research studies, which has led other organizations to then spend an additional $11.1 .1 million on research. So, so whereas there's no way, I personally think, that we could have ever raised more than $1.8 million over these last nine years, it really has taken a lot of hard work. Um, that 1.8 million has turned into to almost 13 million dollars of research for Castleman's because we've spent it really well. We've worked with our community, and that's led other organizations to say, "I really want to support this research as well." And that's funding um, 18 studies that are being done all over the world. Um, the NIH finally funded Castleman's research a few years back. Our team here at Penn um, is predominantly funded through that NIH grant. Um, we now have over 1,200 patients that are part of our contact registry. So if you've signed up on CDCN.org, you're in our contact registry. Um, we joined together the organizations. So there's now one collaborative network. We all work together um, with a unified plan for how do we take down Castleman's. Um, we have a biobank. I hope many of you all have contributed a blood sample or lymph node tissue to that biobank. That biobank serves as the engine um, for discovery within Castleman disease. It's how we learn more and how we improve treatment for Castleman's. Um, we've made progress, though many questions remain. Um, those of you that have joined Accelerate and provided your medical records, um, that's huge. That, that's how we learn more about the disease. If you've given a blood sample or lymph node, that's how we figure this thing out. Um, but importantly, since um, starting up, uh, one of the first things we set out to do was to set out or was to determine diagnostic criteria. And actually, it says the first here, but actually, we developed diagnostic criteria both for idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease and also for unicentric Castleman disease. Um, they didn't exist before. Um, and through lots of hard work, we created them. Um, same thing with treatment guidelines. Um, there, there were no treatment guidelines, and now we have treatment guidelines for both unicentric Castleman disease and idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease that were published in really important journals, so they're read by a lot of hematologists. Um, we have blood tests that can be done to predict whether you're likely to benefit from one drug or another. Siltuximab went on to get FDA approval, and as those of you with idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease know, it's recommended first line for all patients with IMCD, and it's highly effect effective in about one-third to one-half of patients. Um, for patients who don't benefit from IL-6 blockade, we are studying two new treatment approaches. One of them is undergoing a clinical trial here at Penn. Serolimus is the drug that I'm on um, that I'm doing really well with, um, but three more are also under in consideration. Um, so just kind of to, to wrap up um, uh, the last piece of my journey, and that's that I really set out back in 2012 to chase a cure for myself. I, 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 I dreamed of a future with Caitlin. I dreamed of having a family one day. I dreamed of being able to dedicate my life to searching for cures for diseases, which I was, which I was on a mission to do. 
And, um, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to do any of those things unless I found a drug that could save my life. And through um, a series of experiments and through lots and lots of hard work, um, I eventually came across uh, a problem in my immune system, something that I thought could maybe be responsible for my Castleman disease. And based on that, I decided to start testing a drug that had never been used before for Castleman's, um, but it's been around for decades on myself. And I started as patient number one on serolimus. Um, and I was you know, terrified about whether it would make things worse or whether it would work or not work. Um, but I was engaged to Caitlin and I wanted to make it to May 24th, 2014. So I, I took that medicine and I've been taking it every day um, now for the last seven and a half years. And I, I've had my life back and back to, um, to the old Dave of before. And I, and I am with my life back, not only do I have my life from before I got sick, I also have this amazing family um, with, with my daughter, Amelia, and, and, uh, and with Caitlin um, supporting me along the way. So this is Amelia at her second birthday. Um, she actually just had her third birthday. Um, and as I saw Gary put into the, the chat, we're, um, we're expecting we've got um, a little boy due on November 4th. So we're really, really excited that this um, family of, of three is about to be a family of four. And of course, um, as I have just, uh, a picture listed on the, on the screen, um, I wrote a book about this journey called Chasing My Cure, um, that it's been so special to see how far and wide it's reached. Yesterday, I was doing an interview for um, Polish Good Morning America, uh, or the Polish equivalent of Good Morning America, excuse me. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it's really cool because, you know, the book's translated into a bunch of other languages. And, um, you know, we're getting the word out about Castleman disease to, um, to a lot of people around the world. And that's leading to faster diagnoses, better treatment, um, and better awareness for this disease. So thank you to everyone who helped to spread the word about Chasing My Cure here in the U.S. and beyond. It became a national bestseller last year. Um, and just to think that a lot of people are learning about this disease that had never heard about it, that really, really means so much. So I'm going to hit a couple um, lessons, and then I'll transition into Castleman's a bit more. Um, so throughout the book, I, I had a number of lessons, but a couple that I wanted to mention briefly. The first is around hope. I had hoped for so long that a drug would be found for my disease. And then there was a certain point where I realized that if I was going to hope for a drug, that I needed to take action. So I needed to get involved in research, getting samples and funding together. And, and, and for all of you, I think this really rings true. You know, we are all so hopeful that the CDCN will find solutions for us. But the reality is, is that the CDCN can't find any solutions for anything unless we have samples, data, and funding. And so if you can contribute your blood samples, lymph node, data from your medical records, funding towards research, that's how this all works. It's turning our hope into action. The next is that in the midst of really tough times, laughing with the people that I love and the people you love um, has been really powerful um, for me and for my family. Um, the fact that doctors at different stages explained how little we knew about Castleman disease, um, that made me realize how much work we had to, had to do. Um, and sometimes we've, we've learned that solutions can be hiding in plain sight. The drug I was on had been around for decades, but no one had ever tried it for Castleman disease. That gives me incredible hope that there are more drugs out there that we just need to do the research to figure out if they could be helpful for Castleman's. And finally, uh, my book is called Chasing My Cure, but it really should have been called Chasing Our Cures um, because it really has been a team effort. So a, a little bit more about the summit um, and this Castleman's journey. As you guys know, the first thing when you get a diagnosis is, is trying to figure out what is this thing. Um, then you go down a journey where you got to find the right doctor. Um, you've got to find the right therapy. And then you transition into managing symptoms um, and hopefully living with Castleman's disease. So we've tried to, to, to kind of model um, this uh this trajectory um, in, in the way that we put together our summit and of course fighting back against Castleman disease is critical. So we have sessions throughout the summit that are gonna be addressing each of these key points um, and, and how you can be a part of it. Um, so you can see on the slide um, where we are in the agenda. Um, I'm now gonna transition into this sort of, you know, what is Castleman disease um, and take the next 20 minutes or so um, to do that. So first off, Castleman disease describes a group of diseases that all look the same under the microscope or look similar under the microscope, um, but they're very different beyond that. So if you, if you take a lymph node out, you look under the microscope, they look a certain way, but other than the way they look under the microscope, they're really very different. So I've got a picture on the bottom right of, of one piece of one lymph node. 
Um, and when we think about these different diseases, we think about it in terms of unicentric versus multicentric. Unicentric Castleman disease um, involves a single and large lymph node in one region of the body. Um, and it's the most common form of Castleman disease. The cause is unknown, um, but surgical excision is often curative. Unfortunately, it's not always curative, but it's often a curative. And sometimes surgical excision is not even possible. So um, we spend a lot of time um, trying to understand how do you better treat these unresectable cases or cases where they are resected, but they have continued symptoms. The next group of, of patients that we study and consider under Castleman disease is HHV8 associated multicentric Castleman disease. Now you have multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes throughout your body. Patients get very sick with flu-like symptoms and organ dysfunction. Um, they may be hospitalized or in the intensive care unit. Um, this is uh, not as common as unicentric Castleman disease, but we do know what causes it. We know it's a certain virus, the HHV8 virus. We know how it causes Castleman's, and we know that treating it with B-cell depletion with rituximab is very, very effective. This was a very deadly condition until rituximab was introduced, and now there's an approximately, maybe even greater than 90% five-year survival. The final subtype um, is HHV8 negative or idiopathic multicenter Castle disease. This is a subtype that I have where we've got multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes. We've got or our organs not working because of this inflammation, this quote unquote cytokine storm. We know very little about what causes it. And we're starting to learn a lot more about what propagates it, though we don't know what ignites the problem. We know interleukin-6 is really important in some cases, but not all. And we know that blocking interleukin-6 with siltuximab is effective in somewhere between one third and one half of patients. Um, unfortunately, uh, doesn't work for everyone. So a lot of our research is around trying to figure out other drugs for people who don't respond to siltuximab. But the good news is that there's been improvement in outcomes for patients. So, so back in 2012, when we started the CDCN, um, the estimates were about a 55 to 65% five-year survival. Um, more recently, we just did a study that came out this summer um, where there's about a 75% five-year survival. And that's of all patients. And that uh, does not take into account the most recently diagnosed patients where they're on targeted therapy with siltuximab. We think that number is gonna to continue to go up um, thanks to research that we're doing and drugs that we're identifying. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future. And as I think about my, my second child, I have lots of hope that I'll be here uh, for a long time um, with him and the rest of my family. So what does the immune system do and what does that have to do with Castleman disease? Well, the, the goal of the immune system is to keep watch and to make sure that um, the bad things, foreign invaders don't cause problems. And, and actually the home base for your immune system is actually your lymph nodes. So Castleman's isn't a, isn't a disease of lymph nodes, Castleman's is a disease of the immune system. And the lymph nodes are the, the main place that, that immune cells live and where they go to communicate with one another. So um, in a typical immune system, uh, when there's a trigger, like something bad, like a virus or bacteria, that's gonna turn on the immune system. Um, and then that immune system is going to produce a bunch of, of proteins called cytokines, um, which could potentially, you know, get rid of the virus. Um, and then, it, then they stop. Another way to think about it is, is I like to use this firefighter analogy. Firefighters are kind of like your immune system. They're, all, they're in this watchful waiting mode. Um, and then something happens. A fire starts and they, they go out to put out the fire. Um, they, you know, they take out the fire um, and they try to, you know, have as minimal water damage as possible. If we think about this in Castleman's, we've got our immune cells that are inactive, something triggers them, we don't know what, and then they become highly activated. But instead of uh, appropriately turning off when they should, um, they keep going. Um, and so in, in an appropriate immune response, that doesn't happen. Actually, the fire gets controlled, um, the water damage is minimal, and it goes back into a, a dormant state. But as I mentioned in Castleman's, um, the immune system turns on for an unknown cause, um, and actually the, the, the sort of collateral water damage or the damage from the immune system is actually quite serious and it doesn't stop when it's supposed to. So that's what we deal with in multicentric Castleman disease and also um, to some extent also in unicentric Castleman disease. Um, but fortunately there's typically not organ failure um, in unicentric Castleman disease. So, so what causes Castleman disease? Well, we know something activates the immune system. We know the immune system is very complicated. We're trying to figure out the cell types in, involved, what, what kind of propagates that immune response and then the treatments um, that can then be utilized. And so this is really what drives our science and our research is trying to figure out what are the different parts of the immune system that have gone wrong so we can find drugs to make them right. 
Um, another thing I like to always talk about is how the immune system needs to be in balance. Um, you'll hear many people um, on infomercials saying you need to strengthen your immune system. Um, but the problem is, is actually, it's not about having a strong immune system. It's about having an appropriately strong immune system. You don't want it to be too strong. You don't want it to be too weak. Um, it's got to be in balance. So if you have too weak of an immune system, you'll be susceptible to viruses like SARS-CoV-2. Um, you'll be susceptible to cancers because your immune system isn't going around killing cancer cells. Um, but if your immune system is too strong, then you're susceptible to autoimmune conditions. You're susceptible to having damage occurring to your vital organs when your immune system does turn itself on. So what are some symptoms that we see in Castle disease and how does this all fit together? Well, we see patients have enlarged lymph nodes. And as I mentioned, that's because the lymph nodes are the home base for your immune system. So if your immune system's on, it's going to the lymph node to communicate with itself. Um, Flu-like symptoms. This is what happens when your immune system turns on. Liver and kidney dysfunction due to the excessive inflammation. Fluid accumulation, again, due to inflammation, you can gain fluid all throughout your body. At my worst point, I gained 70 pounds of fluid. Um, but then there's a number of other laboratory abnormalities that we see in Castleman's um, that make a doctor think, this seems like Castleman's, like elevated markers of inflammation, like CRP, anemia, low platelets, or high platelets. And these are all things that we see with Castleman's. So how do you diagnose Castleman's disease? Well, if you're on this uh, webinar, I think that nearly everyone has either been diagnosed or has a loved one that's been diagnosed. And so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, the first step is a lymph node biopsy. And then you need to have a lymph node that under the microscope looks like it's demonstrating Castleman disease features. Um, and what I like to do every year when I show this is just point out that the features of a Castleman's lymph node are actually very similar to and, and, and not that different from a lot of lymphomas and autoimmune conditions. It's actually quite difficult to decipher it. And actually you can't really decipher unicentric versus multicentric Castleman disease based on the biopsy. It's really a spectrum of features. Um, there's uh, certain parts of the lymph node that are too small, certain parts that are too big, more blood vessels than you should have. It's really some cells are present that typically aren't present in a normal lymph node, but really it's very much a spectrum. And that's important to keep in mind um, that it's not all that clear. Um, I often like to show this picture because one of them is a Castleman's lymph node and one of them is a normal lymph node. And actually they look really similar. Turns out the top one is a Castleman's lymph node. The bottom one is a normal lymph node. Um, but it's really, it's not that easy. And it's actually quite a spectrum in terms of figuring out, you know, what is a Castleman's lymph node or not. So as I mentioned, once you got the diagnosis, the next step is finding a great physician. Um, we, through the CDCN, Malevin in particular, can help you to find a great doctor here at UPenn through our center called the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory. We have some of the best Castle disease physicians in the world. And we actually have an amazing physician scientist named Josh Brandstandler, who um, is both a researcher and a physician. Um, and he's really dedicating almost all of his attention towards unicentric Castleman disease and also um, towards multicentric Castleman disease. So um, if you wanna find a physician, reach out to Maleva. We would love to have you come here to our center here at Penn, which we call the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory or the CASEL um, is our acronym. And do go to our website to access physicians. So now you've got the lymph node taken out. It looks like Castleman's, you, you've gone to see a Castleman's expert. They're gonna do a scan of your body to confirm how many regions of enlarged lymph nodes do you have? Is it unicentric in one place or is it multicentric in multiple places? And Sheila, later on in the summit, will talk a bit about how there's some grayness. We used to think it was either unicentric or multicentric. Now it's pretty clear there's some people in the middle who have cases that kind of look like unicentric, kind of look multicentric. And so we're trying to tease that out for sure. Um, CT scans or PET scans can be used um, to do this. So uh, there are a number of abnormal laboratory tests that, um, that your clinician is going to look out for. You actually cannot diagnose idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease if you don't have at least one abnormal laboratory test out of six that they can pick from. So if you don't have at least one of them, then you can't be diagnosed with idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. You can be diagnosed with probable IMCD, but the diagnostic criteria does require at least one abnormal laboratory test um, and also a number of clinical features that are commonly seen. Uh, now, at this stage, we think someone may have multicentric Castleman disease, um, but the next thing you have to do is to exclude diseases that can mimic Castleman disease, that can look like Castleman disease under the microscope. And there are a number of diseases. There are autoimmune diseases, malignancies, infections that can all have Castleman's-like appearances. So you got to rule all of those out. And then now you've got to confirmed 
uh, multi-center Castleman disease and then you need to subtype what type of MCD do you have? Um, and the reason that's important is because each subtype has different treatments. Um, so this is really essential. So the first is HHV positive MCD, which we discussed earlier. There's a specific test for that. The next is POMS associated MCD where you have this syndrome called POMS and, uh, and those patients typically respond to different therapies than patients who have neither HHV8 or POMS, we call those idiopathic. Um, and, and for idiopathic, we have this specific diagnostic criteria, which I mentioned before. And again, um, always feel free to reach out to us if there's any questions. We also came out with diagnostic criteria for unicentric Castleman disease um, in the last, I guess, at the end of last year. Um, and you need both the lymph node features and you need at least one enlarged lymph node, but there are no specific clinical or laboratory abnormalities that are required to make the diagnosis of unicentric Castleman disease. So we now have gotten through this, what is Castleman disease session? And um, we've got about 10 minutes or so for questions um, before, we, um, before we move on to our breakout session. So maybe um, Maleva, I might stop sharing my screen. And if Maleva, if you wanna come up as well, and maybe the two of us can, um, can respond to and field any questions that have come up from um, my what is Castleman disease session. Sounds great. And we also have um, Mike and Amber on who can read questions that were um, asked to us so that we can just directly respond to them. Cool. And I see there have been a bunch of messages in the chat. So please feel free to keep sending them through the chat. We are um, thrilled to answer any and all questions. Right. So let's see. Um, first question from Mimi, just looking for some for you to kind of clarify, you know, if multicentric Castleman disease attacks vital organs, why isn't it just fully classified as an autoimmune disorder? And kind of what's the, um, if you can clarify some, some of that stuff. That's, that's a great question. And it, it's great to have that question coming from Mike, because as I mentioned, Mike is uh, our newest immunologist that we've added to the team who's really focused in, in part on, on studying this exact question. So uh, in order to classify a disease as an autoimmune disease, you need to be able to prove that the attack on those vital organs is caused by specific cells called B cells or T cells, and that the organ damage is due to B cells or T cells that are specifically directed at those organs as opposed to just kind of a non-specific general inflammation. And so we are in the midst of doing a couple studies to try to ask that exact question. Um, they're called autoantibodies. Some of you all may have heard that a, a doctor tested autoantibodies in your blood. So we're doing a collaboration where many of you all helped to raise $100,000 that we gave to a researcher at Stanford who's doing this exact study um, to look for these quote unquote autoantibodies. And we also are in the process, Melanie, um, who I mentioned is the other immunologist who just joined our team. Melanie's in the process of putting together a proposal to try to look for um, those T cells and whether those T cells are specific to vital organs. So it's a great question. and and um, you know, what's the saying, you know, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, um, you know, maybe it is a duck. Uh, but, but I think the point here is that it looks a lot like an autoimmune disease, it acts a lot like an autoimmune disease. However, the sort of relentless nature of it, or at least the intensity of it, uh, feels a lot more like a lymphoma. And so, and the appearance under the microscope looks a lot more like a lymphoma. So, you know, we often say that it's neither an autoimmune disease nor a cancer as of yet, and that we haven't figured out which category to put it in, but we're certainly doing research to figure that out. It's a great question. Thank you for that. And we have a question from Allison. David, is your treatment an infusion or tablets? I get both. So my treatment, serolimus, um, are, it's three tablets I take every day. As I mentioned, I've been taking it every day for the last seven and a half years. And I stopped taking it for a couple of weeks around my COVID vaccine. And I have to say, I, I learned that my serolimus is the equivalent of my daughter's safety blanket. You know, I take serolimus every day. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. I'm happy that I'm on it. My daughter, you know, holds her gaga. Um, and that makes her really um, feel warm and fuzzy inside. So I take the same three tablets every day and it's been really um, a life changer for me. Um, like I said, seven and a half years pr previously, I nearly died five times in three years. So um, it, it's been a, a life changer. I also get an infusion of something called IVIG. I get that infused once a month. IVIG also modulates it. it you know, we talked earlier about it's, you don't want to have too strong, you don't have too weak of an immune system. IVIG helps to modulate, kind of get your immune system in the right place. Um, I get that in addition to my serolimus. 
and I should also mention, I mentioned briefly Tracy, who runs our serolimus clinical trial. Um, a number of you all who are on this, or at least several of you, um, are either on serolimus or you're um, part of the serolimus trial. Um, we have an amazing team with Tracy leading the way. Um, for this trial here at Penn. So if anyone is not responding to an IL-6 blocker like sultuximab or tocilizumab, please contact us. Um, we cover costs of your travel, your lodging. We take care of these things and we make it as easy as possible for you to be a part of this trial. And, and these trials are so important because this is how we figure out the right drug for the right patient. All right, thank you. And a question from Andrew. Um, how do you feel from from day to day? Just just kind of aches, pains, side effects, things that things that you experience. I feel very fortunate because I know that many Castleman's patients um, don't feel, um, despite therapy and despite kind of their blood looking healthy and good, that they don't feel um, you know good and like themselves. Uh, I have to say I feel really good. Um, I I have very high energy level. I um, get the chance to work with an amazing team of people like yourself, Mike, and Maleva, and Amber, and, and others. Um, that probably is part of it. Um, I, I have such an awesome team around me, but I feel I feel really good. And, and I, But I, I almost feel guilty saying that because I know that so many of you all are, are still struggling with your Castleman disease, but I can tell you that I'm channeling the good energy towards trying to find solutions so that those of you that are not yet feeling good will, will feel good soon. All right, great. And let's see, trying to keep up. Question from Gary. I hear Castleman um, described as a syndrome instead of a disease more and more frequently. And is, is that description accurate? And what does that kind of mean for treatment and, and the overall process? It's a great question. So historically, there have been differences between what's a syndrome versus what it, what's a disease. And really, syndromes were reserved for things that you really had no idea what was going on, but you could at least describe like this is the syndrome of findings. Like you might have low platelets and fluid accumulation. TAFRA was called a syndrome because there's a handful of clinical features that TAFRA patients, which is the most severe subtype of IMCD, there's a syndrome of things that are found. Um, I tend to, to put Castleman disease into the disease category for, um, for at least some Castleman disease patients. And for example, HHV positive MCD, there's a clear etiology. We know what starts it. We know what causes it. We know everything about it. We know how to treat it. Um, we can you know, nail, nail that down. Um, and then we've got patients with unicentric and also idiopathic MCD where it looks very similar to that, but it's obviously subtly different. And so I, I consider it a disease, um, but I do think that, um, uh, there are aspects of it that are very like syndrome. G Gary always has the best questions, by the way. I know there's no right, competition well. for questions, but I always, <laughs> love, I always love Gary's questions. We'll have, we'll have a second question from Gary. So, um, so he has questions about under what circumstances is, is he able to give blood? Is, is he able to act as an organ donor? Um, are there any concerns that need to go into, into that thought process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think that there are any rules banning us from either being an organ donor or donating blood. And in fact, I'm, I'm an organ donor, um, uh, but I haven't given blood. And part of the reason I haven't given blood is because, um, like I said, I don't think there are any rules that exclude us, but those of us that have received a lot of transfusions in our time, and also those of us that have, um, you know, have weird, unique immune issues, I think it's probably, I don't think that we would cause harm by giving blood, but I don't know. I just, I, I worry that there could be some underlying thing that I don't, it actually, you know, you, you try to do something good and you cause a problem. Well, I don't know what you'd add to that. I mean, I, I've had patients ask me, and I think that um, if you really feel inclined to want to donate blood, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and, and all they'll do is, you know, do all the screenings they need to on and determine yep. if they can use it. Um, and I know some people just really feel like they wanted to be able to do something like that. So I would never say no, but I agree with David. I mean, who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, and, you know, Malava, it's funny because um, I oftentimes talk about how chemotherapy saved my life, serolimus has saved my life, but the reality is the things that at the, like at my lowest, when I was like teetering before I got these drugs, it was the transfusions. It was the blood cell, it was yeah. the red blood cells, it was the platelets, it was the fresh frozen plasma. It's these blood products that really kept me, you know, while I was teetering, kept me here. And then the chemo and all these other things could kick in. So, I mean, for me, I think the best way that you can kind of pay it forward 
certainly you can donate yourself, but another way you can pay it forward is to rally your family and friends and let them know like, hey, like this stuff was critical for me and yeah. may not be needed for me, but it may be needed for someone else in the future. So I think, and I think that's another way to think about it. Absolutely. I do want to be mindful of the time. So we have about six minutes before we're going to go to our break. If your questions do not get to get answered, that's okay. Our team's jotting them down. We will make sure to answer them and send them to you. I'm going to interrupt you, Mike. I got a text question in, so I want to make sure I read this nice. to you, David. Um, nice. So we have an inoperable UCD patient who's currently on Siltox. Their numbers are okay, but they're still having symptoms. Wondering what the thoughts are on should they try serolimus next? Yeah, it's a great question. So in unresectable unicentric calcium disease, we, as, as we mentioned earlier, we came out with guidelines last December. And the first question, if you have unresectable UCD, is are the symptoms you're having due to compression? So is it an issue where the enlarged lymph node is pushing on, say, a blood vessel or a nerve? Or are the symptoms you're having related to inflammation, meaning that you'd have an elevated C-reactive protein or a low albumin level, something that's suggesting that your symptoms are due to an inflammatory response? If your symptoms are due to an inflammatory response, um, then siltuximab is a really reasonable approach and, and, and it should be able to help to improve your symptoms. Um, but if your symptoms are due to compression, like your lymph nodes pushing on things, then rituximab is what we recommend for those patients. Um, in either group of patient where siltuximab or rituximab don't work, then you can certainly consider serolimus next. And, and I would consider serolimus if the siltuximab is not working and if you were having an inflammatory issue. Now, if you're having a compression issue and you got siltuximab, you probably should try rituximab out before you move on to serolimus. But assuming that doesn't work, serolimus would be the next thing. And then in our guidelines, the next thing we recommend is, is considering and talking to your doctor about radiation. We, we like to avoid radiation if we can. Frankly, we like to avoid chemotherapy if we can, but sometimes you've got to, to do things that we like to avoid um, if that's gonna you know, help to get you better. All right. I have another question here. How do you know if calcium disease is primary or secondary if you're, if you're di diagnosed with a number of, of different things? Oh gosh, that's a that's a great, great question. question. Yeah, it's a really good question. And we don't know. I mean, I think that there are certain things that we know, like, so for example, unicentric Castleman disease is the number one cause of perineoplastic pemphigus. So if you have UCD and you have perineoplastic pemphigus, you know that the unicentric Castleman disease caused the perineoplastic pemphigus and not the other way around. If you have multicentric Castleman disease and POEM syndrome, we believe it's the POEM syndrome that's causing the multicentric Castleman disease. If you have HHV8 and MCD, we believe it's the HHV8 that's causing the MCD. And so, um, you know, these are examples where those are clear cut ones, but if you have um, Sjogren syndrome and Castleman's, or if you have, um, sometimes they'll say that you have ITP, so you have low platelets um, due to uh, immune, immune dysfunction and you have Castleman's, we usually say, well, you just have Castleman's. We, someone just kind of, you know, maybe gave you two, two names for the same disease. Um, but I think it's really, it's tough, but it's important to look at these. I mentioned the Accelerate Registry earlier where, where we go through every single patient. So anyone who's part of Accelerate, we've gone through your medical records page by page, extracted out every data point. On average, there are about a thousand pages per patient. And on average, we extract out between 3,000 and 4,000 data points. This is the hard work that Mateo and Russell do. And so from those, one of the key things we look at is this question of comorbidities. What other diseases are in your medical record along with your Castleman disease? Because sometimes we'll find something that's called a comorbidity like lymphoma, but we really think that maybe you just have lymphoma and you seem to have Castleman's, but we should focus on the lymphoma. So trying to keep up with a whole bunch of questions. Um, let's see, is there a difference in treatment for people that are 12 and under, let's say? So is there, are there age differences with, with how um, Castleman is treated? That's a great question. There is not currently. Um, as of right now, we recommend the same thing for pediatric cases as adult cases. And generally, pediatric patients look very similar to adult patients in terms of their clinical presentation. If anything, we see that Pediatric patients with multicentric calcium disease tend to be more severe than adult patients with MCD. And so as a result, we should be even more aggressive um, with treatment. But, um, but as of right now, we don't separate treatment based on age. All right. And Maleva, I want to I want to stay um, you know with time. Do, do we have time for a few more or, or did you want to? 
we'll the take one session. more. Um, and then again, just so you guys know, we are taking notes on every question asked. I will work with our team to get those answers and make sure they're sent back out to everybody, not only just who registered, but just our community in general. So um, let's take one more and then we'll go to our break and then break out to our three small subgroups. Sounds great. All right, let's see. Let's, let's pick another one. Um, how often do patients go in to see or check up with their physicians when they're in remission? Like what, what's a good kind of time frame to do that? Yeah, that's a, these are awesome questions. Um, so we recommend uh, that until you're quote unquote in remission, and I should just quickly define remission because we use a lot of terms like remission and flare and relapse and cure. And, and I think that generally when we say remission, we mean that most if not all, hopefully, but most of your symptoms and lab tests are normal. That the lymph nodes no longer enlarge, like that's remission. Like whatever was your Castleman's is just not here. And then flare is whatever is your Castleman disease, whether it's abnormal lab tests or symptoms or enlarged lymph nodes, that they're, they're, they're actually present there. Um, and a relapse would be going from like a remission state to, you know, to starting to be in a flare state. So, um, given that sort of concept of remission flare and recognizing that a lot of people are kind of in between, you know, you might be kind of in a partial response, kind of remission, kind of flare. Um, uh, and obviously we always try to get you to remission, but if you're in remission, um, then with the recommendation right now is that every three to six months, you would go to see your doctor. Now, after the first year or so, it's really up to you and your doctor to talk about, you know, what the frequency should look like moving forward. Because for example, for me, you know, I'm, and you can probably imagine I'm very diligent and on top of my, my health. I, I only see a doctor every six months. Um, and then actually sometimes it becomes during the pandemic, it becomes a year and a half. Um, but, but so I think that, um, I think it's important to talk to your doctor. All right. Awesome. Um, so guys, we are at our break point. We're going to take a nine minute break. Um, I saw Amber already threw into the chat, the links for the next sessions. They are also in the email that you got this morning around nine twenty nine thirty ish. Um, any issues, please text me or email me. I will do my best to respond as soon as possible. These next sessions are broken down by your subtype. So obviously feel free to go to wherever one you want to learn the most information about, but for our idiopathic multicentric calcium patients, go there. That's where Dr. Van Reeve will present, Dr. David and uh, Dr. Nasta will be there for the Q&A session. For our unicentric patients, we have Dr. Eric Oxenhendler, who is an awesome, amazing expert in this field, who will be there to present about that followed by um, Dr. Josh Brandstander from our, our team, who's gonna handle um, giving all the research updates that we're doing right now with unicentric Castleman disease. And for our HHV8 positive patients, we have Dr. Lorraine, who's gonna present, and we have Dr. Aaron Goodman, who's also gonna be on to answer questions. So please um, take those few minutes to grab your coffee, grab a drink, grab a snack, whatever you need, and then go to those next links and we will be ready for you guys in a few minutes. Oh, and right, love, there's one other thing we want you to do during this break, and that's a Castleman Warrior Flex picture. So if you if you you know haven't done your picture yet, make sure you get one Castleman Warrior Flex, get your family involved in it. We got we, you know, we have a competition again this year. So we need really good warrior flex flex pictures um, so we can vote and select our best warrior flex for tomorrow. Thanks for the reminder. And I just saw a question come through. Yes, Zoom does provide auto transcripts. It takes me about a week or two to kind of go through all of it. I will type all of that up so that you can have an actually transcribed um, version of Zoom so you can read through it as well. Yeah. And then also, I think now is also a good time to put in your order through Uber Eats for yep. lunch. Great. Get some good lunch. Guys, we'll Thanks see you in a little everyone. bit. See you.